There we go. Welcome to the 15th episode of the Rethinking Porn Addiction show. My name is Nate Bagley. If you're watching on video, you'll see on the top row here, I'm with Jake Hodson and Hans Hubrick. And uh, we are your average Joes that show up and talk about our history and feelings and emotions around pornography. And um, we're led through these sexual health conversations, as we've so lovingly dubbed them, by Kristen Hodson down below and Doug Braun Harvey. They are both clinicians. They're incredibly talented and experienced. They're wonderful human beings. And um, just to call out the relationship in the room, as I do every week, we've got Jake and Kristen who are married. Uh, we've got Kristen and Nate and Hans who are longtime friends. Chris, Kristen, Jake, and Hans have been friends way longer than they've been friends with me, but we're all friends. All and friends. Um, in, in the friendship circle, Doug is the newcomer, but as far as this topic is concerned, he's the friend. <laughs> he's been doing this for many decades. And so yeah. we're really grateful to have him in the room, lending his expertise and guiding us through these really complex and nuanced conversations. And this week, I'm excited um, because we're talking about one of those hot button topics that we hear a lot about uh, in, in, it's kind of in the zeitgeist lately. We talk about boundaries a lot. We hear the word boundaries. And last week, we started having a conversation around boundaries where we talked about agreements. We talked about rules of engagement in your relationship. Um, but what we didn't get to is what happens when there are rules, whether they are spoken or unspoken, they get violated in, in your relationship. What do you do? What do you do if a boundary is crossed? Or what do you do if you cross a boundary for your partner? And I think boundaries are easy to talk about um, in the setting up or like the, what the kind of general definition is. But I think boundaries get really confusing and muddled and complicated when boundaries are tested. And that's, I think, what, what I would like to talk about today is um, when boundaries get complicated, when a boundary mm -hmm. is violated or crossed or challenged in some way, what the heck do we do and how do we, how do we deal with that in a productive way that doesn't lead to uh, you know, all of the things that we've been trying to avoid in these conversations, the, the e exploitative behavior, the manipulation, the lying, the anger, the emotional explosions, um, you know, how do we deal with that when, when uh, crossing a boundary can be really painful and, and upsetting? So that's, that kind of sets up the conversation today. Um, I kind of want to just make a summary comment, Nate, about yeah. what you said, because you did a great job in the introduction and you eventually got to three words that I think are going to be really friendly words for us today. Great. You said violation, uh -huh. you said crossing, and you said challenge. And those are three words that can kind of differentiate what we mean by boundaries. That boundaries can be violated, uh, boundaries can be crossed, and but we have boundary challenges. Uh, Kristen and I just had a boundary challenge. We're, who's going to talk first? Uh, you, you, welcome to life, right? And that's a boundary challenge. So, uh, you know, um, I, I just want to maybe welcome that when we talk about boundaries, it's not a binary, it's not an either or. There are different situations and different ways we can talk about boundaries. And so I like how you already walked us into that conversation. Thank you. That was, that was probably unintentionally inspired by conversations that you and I, or we've had as a group in the past. And I'd, I'd love before we kind of like pass the torch off to anybody else, can you explain a little bit more what you mean by those? Like you rattled off three different terms, but I, I think we should get more specific around what you mean by a, a boundary being challenged versus crossed versus violated. Well, boundary challenges are unavoidable. They happen in everyday life. So we have to. We have. So when we say about a boundary, we can we can make it sound like it's a scary thing or it's not supposed to happen. We deal with boundaries all the time. Boundary challenges. The light's yellow. Am I going to stop or am I going to go? <laughs> uh, you know, that's a boundary challenge. These are momentary decisions we have to make all the time. Uh, so boundary challenges are normal human life. And then we have issues around boundaries being crossed. Now, a boundary being crossed might be when somebody has kind of said, you know, I'd really prefer you not do that. And the person kind of tries to get you to change your mind and do it anyways. Uh, you know, I, I, you know uh, I, 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 they try to, it's, it's an attempt or it may be even a bit more of a, an aggressive attempt to get somebody to you know, change a boundary or they don't respect a boundary that's been set. 
And a boundary violation is, uh, is, is, is quite a, a, an intentional and um, can be quite harmful um, uh, more than a boundary crossing. It, 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 it's injurious, it causes harm uh, and injury and pain. Um, and uh, it, it, what we tend to think of most, uh, are what, that's what we're talking about with boundaries. But I think it's most important, what I like to talk about is because we tend to think boundaries are the really scary things. And there's lots of ways boundaries are challenged or crossed other than the most egregious violations. Thanks for elaborating, that was really helpful. Doug, can I add that boundaries when they're discussed or when they're challenged can also elicit kind of what we talked about in prior episodes of shame or like, oh, I've just done something wrong was ugh, like I stepped into it. Or um, I think at times boundaries make people feel like, what am I trying to say? The boundaries can cause couples to feel like there's something wrong with us instead of this is a functional part of a relationship. There's nothing wrong. It just boundaries just are instead of there, there's something in place that I have to put up a hard boundary around. It's just like, I guess what I'm hearing you say is you're normalizing boundaries and trying to pull it down that they are part of everyday living in the fabric of relational lives. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good summary. So how do we start this conversation? Now that we have a kind of a clarity around what we're talking about, um, you know, maybe maybe I can present a uh, scenario. We can well, kind of why, don't, why don't we see if Jake and Hans have just something, they, they've been listening here for a few minutes, what's coming up? What, I love what that. You think about when, you, when you hear about these different ways that boundaries can present themselves. Um, <clears throat> I've been thinking, okay, how do I, how do I extrapolate this into the conversation we've been having about rethinking porn addiction? And I thought back to, and I don't know if this is where we want to start or where we want to go, but I thought back to uh, the boundary challenge or violation that Cammy and I went through when she first really discovered my usage of, or my viewing of porn and sexual imagery. Well, and, there, there's the three boundaries. Which do you think, what would you call it, Hans? In, your, in that moment, a boundary violation, a boundary crossing, a boundary challenge, what would you call that? That's the interesting thing for me, and maybe it could be an interesting point of conversation, is we hadn't had an explicit conversation about sexual imagery in our relationship or about porn. Um, but there, because of my upbringing and because of our... Uh, the morals, I would, I guess, or the values, I would say, that we had in our relationship from the beginning, uh, I, I intrinsically knew or felt that viewing pornography was not going to be uh, viewed pleasantly by Cami and something that she would not like to have to deal with. Um, but it wasn't spoken about. And so there were, I guess I'm wondering, there were boundaries that were set or established even without explicit conversation about them and then when we ran into that conflict then we had to start to define or figure out what those boundaries were and how they were going to be uh defined and respected and and maneuvered around mm -hmm. yeah. so i guess there's a question for me about the establishment of boundaries outside of explicit conversations and how we start to do that in a healthy way um yeah. or if it just boundaries just get defined as we bump into them and we're almost unknowing about whoa there's a boundary there that i didn't even realize or that we hadn't talked about but yeah because of the emotion that's in this there's certainly a boundary there that needs to be discovered and and uh and sorted th sorted through in, in my experience it's typically the latter i think um it kind of like in the pre previous episodes doug doug said the price of admission Mm -hmm. For a sexual health conversation is you have to hurt somebody or be hurt yeah. or diagnosed with the disease. Yeah. And I think oftentimes the cost of a, a boundary conversation is you have to violate an unspoken boundary. And then all of a sudden you have a conversation about it in, in many cases. That's, that's at least been my experience. The majority of the time when it comes to boundaries is I, the conversation comes up after an unspoken boundary has been crossed. Yeah. Some way or challenged. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I had a similar conversation with those that echoed what you just said, Nate, about the price of admission into these conversations. And it was with Cammy. We were just talking casually about a number of things. Um, but what came up that was interesting for me was uh, even if we had had a conversation about pornography prior to her discovering that I was using it and viewing it, that would have been a difficult conversation just to move into to begin with. Um, so even approaching those boundaries, even in a non-threatening, non-conflicted, non-emotional outburst kind of way, approaching those boundaries and figuring out what they are seems to be emotionally charged and difficult and a skill that, like we've talked about, probably needs to be practiced. So can I ask you three a question then? When you hear the word boundaries, what is your emotional experience with boundaries? Were you, have they always been fraught with like tension? Have you had different experiences with boundaries? Have you had some where it felt like, I, I guess I'm just looking at what has been your experience moving through life with boundaries? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about when sort of Doug was walking us through the beginning and he talked about sort of, the, you know, there's the challenge, the cross, and then the violated. And he mentioned the yellow light. And I thought that was really interesting because I've never really thought of that as a boundary. And I think, so Chris, when you, when you ask about like what comes up, I think where my mind has kind of gone to is how much we have sort of understood or implicit boundaries that steer our lives. And then Hans, when you mentioned, you know, I hadn't had an explicit conversation with Cami, but then you also said, but I think it would have been really hard to do to bring up. In my mind, it's because we have sort of that implicit understanding of, you know, an agreement for better, you know, what it yeah. is might still be a little amorphous, but there's yeah. obviously the bedrock of something there, right? And I think, so the emotions that come up when I think about challenges or, you know, boundaries is it's sort of this interesting balance between um tension and safety i guess for lack of a better word in that if it's a boundary that i've set and i feel good around and it's been expressed and it's very you know concrete and the other person has a similar understanding than i have and i think it's a place of safety or you know it's a place of understanding um but i think if, unless you have that this sort of that understanding and articulation of what that boundary is, that's where I start to feel a little bit more tension around them because it is sort of this um, unspoken or, you know, you've been taught to slow down that yellow light, but other people have had their parents model just flying through. And so it's, there's this sort of unspoken nature to what it is and it's not really concrete. And so as you approach that yellow light, there's that little hesitation or um, tension that arises around it. I, I know for me, um, like I've read books on boundaries. I've listened to podcasts on it. Like I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and it's still hard for me to separate uh, or, or differentiate the difference between differentiate between boundaries and ultimatums. Mm -hmm. Um you know, like we've talked in the past about the severing response and like threatening to end a relationship if something happens. And to me, a boundary is you're kind of outlining what's acceptable and what's not acceptable or what's tolerable, tolerable or intolerable or what makes you feel safe or unsafe in a relationship. And if that boundary gets crossed, there's a consequence. And that consequence to like, I have a hard time delineating between what's like a what's a threat or an ultimatum or like a line in the sand, this will happen like kind of manipulative from a manipulative perspective. And then on the flip side, like, I, I don't think, I don't know. The, does that make sense? There's like a, a blurriness between the well, two. Well, let you remember an ultimatum is just letting somebody know of a potential consequence should a request or a demand not be met. It it, off, it it comes across as a threat, though sometimes in my mind. Well, it is, it, 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 but but uh, of course, because it's a it's a severe unwanted consequence. Got it. Another person could hear the threat of the severing response and go, "Oh, good. Then I don't have to say it." 
uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a consequence. It's, you're, you're letting somebody know, here's something I'm willing to do and consider doing. But a boundary is a request. A boundary is a statement of something you want and need. You know, I, I don't want you to enter my bedroom unless I'm home. That, that, you know, that, that's a statement of something. That now, the, the consequence might be if you enter my bedroom when I'm not at home, you know, uh, you know I'll do something terrible. <laughs> well, kind of the difference between no trespassing, boundary, or no trespassing, you'll be shot. <laughs> there's, like a, there's like an additional, because I'm wondering, going back to you, Nate, and keeping this here for a minute, is for you, I'm wondering if a boundary and a consequence has been conflated. And, and so your mind automatically goes to a consequence that if someone sets a boundary with you, your mind already goes to, oh, great. And if I don't, then X, Y, or Z will happen. Because there are boundary conversations where you might say, don't come into my room. And there's no, and if you do, I'll do what? It's just, it right. starts with the request. I think that I have an aversion to to threats in a relationship. Like it, that makes me deeply uncomfortable to think of partners threatening each other. But I also understand the importance of like creating safety. Um, and then there's also that, like there's also that that helpless feeling of creating a boundary, having it be crossed, and then being like, well, well now what do I do? Do you know what I mean? I, I, what you were naming was exactly right. Like if I say, don't come in my room unless I'm home and I walk in the door and you're in my room and I go, I said, don't do that. And it, it's like, well, what do I yes. do? What, what or, do I, Yes. you know, what do you do when you, when you maybe your partner's looking at porn and you're like, please, like, I don't want this to be a part of my relationship. And then you catch them again, or it comes out again. We've talked about this seven times and you keep hiding this behavior from me. And I told you that it's not acceptable. And like, I, at what point there's there's like this really fuzzy area between like communicating what you need and communicating what you want and if that perpetually gets crossed not knowing what to do when that happens because you don't want to um kill a fly with an atom bomb like you don't want to overreact but at the same time sometimes it's hard to really know what an appropriate response to a a boundary crossing or a boundary challenge or a boundary violation would be and on the flip side, how to respond when you're the perpetrator, when you're the one who's crossed the boundary. I think there's there's a, a lot of confusion there around like, well, how do I repair? And what do I do if, I don't know, it's, I feel the tension in my body mm -hmm. talking about this because there's so much ambiguity around it. And despite having done so much thought and research and even writing around it, there's still a sense of like helplessness around the actual execution of a boundary as opposed to the establishing of the boundary. So perhaps one of the things that's most difficult to do is to walk up to somebody you love and care about and said, I, um, I crossed a boundary. The violation may be crossing a boundary and being dishonest about it. That might be more of a violation, but you know, we can make agreements and we can cross a boundary. And walking up to somebody and say, you know, I, I crossed a boundary. That's a really hard thing to do, but it can be done. Especially not knowing what the consequence is going to be. I think that's a, a big reason a lot of, we talked about shame being one of the reasons that um, people hide their behavior, yeah. like pornography. And I think the other really strong reason for a lot of people is fear of the consequence like there's shame yes but there's also like i don't i know that i've broken my partner's trust or i know i've i've done something that goes against an implied or agreement that we have some sort of boundary that's set and i'm afraid to know what the what the repercussions are going to be the consequences of my actions i could lose everything one of the things i talk with men about a lot is they'll get hung up where you just were yeah. They're so focused on the other person's response. And I talk with men about, well, what's the consequences for you, you, when you don't disclose you've crossed a boundary? That, that, that's you. That's your life. Right. 
What's, you know, you get so preoccupied in how somebody else is going to respond. It's as if it doesn't matter that it has, it may have a real important consequence for you and how you live on this planet. Oh, that's a heavy you weight. You have a really important boundary and you not told somebody that you love and care about. Let's think about that. Chris, you asked earlier about experiences with boundaries and what it's been like to come up to them or cross them or violate them. Um, <clears throat> and then you mentioned, I think, <clears throat> a little bit later about the idea of that they can also offer, offer safety and they can offer, um, I guess, comfort of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and I've experienced that now in my relationship with with Cami about when we have been able to establish a boundary and then we've been able to mutually keep that it feels fantastic like it feels like i am being respected or she's being respected or we both are respecting each other in our relationship and that feels like a really incredible thing to do and i'm interested having experienced that and now also hearing Nate your uh your emotion about, I'm not really sure about where boundaries are or how they get set or um, there's just an interesting dichotomy around, and maybe it's a perspective shift, maybe it's life experience. I'm not sure what the differentiator is, but the dichotomy between feeling that emotional explosion and charge around coming up against a boundary versus successfully uh, establishing and keeping one is, is interesting to me. It seems to me that the emotion comes up after the boundary's been crossed. Yeah. Right? Like that's when you start to get into ultimatums because you're mostly focusing on protecting one party or the other. Like in my past, ultimatums were usually preceded by like a, a violation. Yeah. And it was reactionary. It was designed to protect. It, it wasn't about understanding. And to me, I think setting the boundary is about understanding and it's, done sort of beforehand you know if you are able to clearly articulate the boundary what you're asking or what's being set up and why and everything else so that you're you know you're on the same page then questions are and all the you know dialogue is more around understanding than about patting oneself or protecting oneself and stopping so that there can be less pain down the road yeah. Nate, I'm going to play, I'm going to play pseudo therapist, or I'm just going to ask a question. I feel like I'm asking it like a therapist would, but <laughs> uh, have you had experiences or can you think of something in your relationships with anybody where you have successfully, uh, I'm going to say preemptively, but beforehand talked about a boundary or talked about some kind of agreement and then uh, have have successfully honored that and kept it. Anything come to mind about having done that? I'm curious to hear what your experience was or what that might have been, what it was like. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had several of those experiences. Several. Uh, the specific ones that pop into mind right now are not ones I, I really want to share. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> now, there's an example of a boundary challenge. Right. Very good. Yeah. You invited something that Nate could have shared, and Nate, Nate, Nate. That's a boundary challenge. Nate said, "You know what? I, I, I'm going to keep that private. I, I don't want to share that." There it yeah. is. That's, how, that's what it looks like. That's a boundary challenge conversation right there. Um, a, a good example is uh, like agreements. I'm thinking. I'm thinking specifically about my marriage with Ange because sure. I, I feel like it, it fits the context here. Uh, like a great example is um, when Ange got pregnant. And we had had an agreement before she was pregnant of kind of how the roles and responsibilities would be executed in our house and like who was taking care of which chores and who was making dinner which nights. And it was really, we had a system. Yeah. And then she got pregnant and her energy levels dropped and she was sick and tired and it was just really hard and we didn't renegotiate. And so I was, I was feeling like a boundary was being challenged in that I was taking responsibility, taking on responsibilities that I was not used to taking on. Yeah. Um, and as we, we, we were able to sit down and renegotiate and have a conversation that helped me gain a little bit more perspective in her situation. And, um, and I walked away 
having the same responsibilities, maybe even more than I had been resentful of over the last couple of weeks. But this time, but now after having the conversation and understanding where she was at, I was actually eager and excited to, to help her with those things and, and kind of like participate in this new agreement in a way that was equitable with the new challenges that were placed on her. Yeah. Um, that was really rewarding for me. And, and what did you feel when you watched yourself keeping these agreements? Uh, oh, I was proud of myself. Them. Yeah, a sense of a sense of like self-esteem, um, self-respect. I felt like I was making a contribution. There was a sense of pride. Uh, I had a lot more gratitude towards my partner. Um, I felt like I was being the type of husband that I wanted to be. Um, but on the flip side, I, I want to, if I can kind of push back, like. I, since we started this show, I probably get a couple of emails every week, um, typically from a wife saying my husband keeps looking at porn, even though we have conversations about, about yeah. not. And where I kind of, there are perpetual issues or gridlocked issues in any relationship where the problem persists, despite the, the, the conversations that happen around it. And I think where I feel the most anxiety is what do you do in a scenario where you continue continually reestablish or renegotiate boundaries and they keep getting crossed or violated um it, almost in a disrespectful or blatant disregard for the bound for the actual effort and, and work that you've gone to set the boundary in the first place and i don't i don't know what to do like i don't know the answer to that question like i get i get emotionally flooded and i go and <laughs> I, I just i i don't know how to clearly answer that in an adult way, like, what do you do? So I, I was hoping we could circle to this and Doug, I'm, I, I feel like this is where collaboratively we, we could talk this through because what comes up for me is, you know, I think sometimes when people are dealing with that of a repetitive boundary violation, they maneuver it a bit more like chess. And it's like, okay, I need to do, I need to think through, through what I'm gonna do and I'm going to kind of think what they're going to do. And I'll map out my minute, my I'm minute. To do like three steps ahead instead of getting clarity with themselves and stepping back and exploring what about this boundary continues to get violated. Because as I work with couples, I'm like, let's pull it back. How did this boundary get established? Was it a conversation? Was it a, a unilateral decision? How did it get made? And then, I don't know where Doug would come in and to say, is that a boundary if, if it's the man that you, that is working for you to uphold or do you need, are you agreeing to something that you're ultimately not wanting to agree to? And now you've got a new thing to discuss and decide and agree upon because I think within religious cultures, it's very quick to be like, we're not going to look at porn. Yeah. I'm not going to look at porn because there's like the already answer instead of being like, because I then go to, you continue now to, now you're eroding another principle of sexual health, which is honesty. And now we're eroding the fundamental floor of our relationship because we keep establishing this boundary. You're saying yes, I'm saying yes. We leave the conversation on the same page and it's not upheld. And so that's what comes up for me is we may need to revisit this boundary that continues to get violated is, is this really what the boundary is or what we are agreeing to, because maybe we need to revisit that. And that can open up a whole other conversation, but that's collaborative. Instead of trying to mind map and maneuver to get what you want, you, you have to get clarity and be able to tolerate the emotion that exists in a possibly really uncomfortable conversation. Well, I, want, I want to back up to conversations I have with men before they take it to the major leagues. I'm going to call the major leagues the conversation with their partner. Uh, so they, there's minor league practice that has to happen before you take it to the major leagues. And I called the minor league practice men sitting in group therapy with each other or some interaction with each other and men learning how to say, I'm not going to keep this boundary for the next week. They would have an agreement with the group and they were going to maybe keep a boundary on their sexual health plan. And we'd say, do you want to keep this boundary? And sometimes if they were really honest, they'd say, no, I, I don't want to keep that boundary right now. Okay, well, all right, what do you want to do? And, and I don't, I, I don't want to have this boundary for a week. Oh, okay, well, all right. 
let's see what it's like to be honest about that rather than to keep coming back here and telling us week after week, you're going to keep the boundary and don't. What would it be like to just say, you know what, this week I'm not keeping the boundary. And, and, and just be honest about that. Because I think this is forbidden in most relationships. Yeah. It's absolutely forbidden. What is it? What does that do for somebody? Because I, I like my immediate reaction is like, oh, hell to the no. What's yeah. hell to the no? Like, what's your immediate? Like, what are you saying hell to the no to? To to like to, to it to like I understand the 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 idea of being honest with yourself about like not wanting to keep a boundary that you've agreed to for a really long time and, and others. This is, you know, this was an agreement with other and men other, in the group, and but it, was, it wasn't the big league. It wasn't their partner. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but there's, there's something like unsettling about giving yourself permission to just say like, you know what? No, like that's not a boundary. Why is that more unsettling than breaking it? Because I think in, in the, in the remaking Violating it or crossing the boundary, I think you're, you're having to come face to face with the uh, uh, the darkest version of yourself. Great. Welcome I to think, life. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just trying to puzzle this out, Doug. Yeah, right. You're like, doing uh, great. You're doing great. You see, this is what so when you take it to the relationship and you 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 immediately make the conversation between partners, this is what gets avoided. Right. Looking at oneself. And, and like I, uh, there's a part of me that because of the way I was raised or just who I am that I, I want to, I want to strive to be the best version of myself possible. And there's something deeply unsettling of saying like, Hey, there's a behavior that I, or there's a commitment I've made to not do something specifically something that goes against my values, but I kind of want to do it anyway. And you know what? I'm going to kick the values to the, to the side for a while and just admit that I have a dark, piece of myself or a, not even dark, just a, a piece of myself that actually really wants to do this thing that I even consider to be morally wrong in one way or another. And um, like writing that, like that's a scary thing to, to face, like writing yourself that blank check. Okay, I'm going to go do it. Or I'm going to give myself permission to do it. Those are two different things, obviously, but. So I think men would prefer being seen as a no good Nick. Uh, and a untrustworthy person and uh, somebody who crosses boundaries than being the person you just told us you would be. Right. And I also hear along with that is it keeps you accountable and you get your lashings for not upholding your commitment and you get to deserve like, I've got to go face that I broke it and it keeps me accountable and that will get me closer to being the person I want to be where if I accept it, I could erode into the worst version of myself, believing that you don't have other values that you would actually, those don't disappear. That those other values would actually, you would have to keep confronting that. But I think there can be this idea that if you let yourself off the hook, then now you've given yourself loopholes forevermore and you've just devolved into this glob. Great summary. Now, here's what would happen in group. We, this is a therapy situation with group, but this is what happened with group. The men would say, I'm not keeping the boundary next week. Okay. And the group would, you know, fine. Thank you for your honesty. They come back the next week and they didn't cross their boundaries as much. Didn't mean they didn't cross their boundaries, but yeah. they, did, they did it less often. This conversation, no. Oh. Go ahead. I, I want to know why that happens. <clears throat> Well, you have to ask people, and they usually know why. <laughs> it's not a mystery. They, you, if you just say, well, why do you think you crossed your boundaries less? What, what, do you, what, what do you think? What did you notice differently about yourself when you weren't worried about coming to us in a state of shame that you crossed your boundaries? How was that? What was your week like? How was it different for you? Because you weren't walking around with that hangdog fear, fear in yourself walking in this room a week later. And they began to they began to understand there are different reasons why you cross boundaries at different times, and uh, uh, they 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 put the focus on themselves rather than the fear of the partner's response. They they gave up being afraid of how the group was going to respond. They gave up how I was going to respond as the therapist, and they had to face themselves. That's what I mean by the minor leagues before you take it to the major leagues. When we move too quickly to the marital relationship. This is where men get off the hook and having to look at themselves. 
and it keeps women as the gatekeeper and men confessing to them to keep them accountable. Yeah. And that's a dynamic that often works against the couple yeah. and it works against, uh, we won't go down this other thing, but that dynamic gets quickly shaped. And then women oftentimes don't have any desire because now they're their partner's gatekeeper and they've killed all the eroticism. But that major leagues, like Doug is saying, they go confess in a way to relieve themselves. And now, uh, like I will see partners set up agreements like, okay, every time I look at porn, I'm going to come tell you. So I keep myself accountable. And I hear wives be like, I don't want that. <laughs> like, I don't want to be the one that you're doing that with. Like, deal with that yourself. I, I don't, that's not my job. I heard some really interesting, uh, the conversation took a really interesting turn for me, Nate, when you were talking last. And that was that the boundaries we've talked about, at least that I have been thinking and exploring in my mind, have been boundaries between a partnership of some sort or relationship. And when I heard you talking, uh, part of that, what just revealed itself to me or that I heard was that there's a boundary with yourself, your own moral boundary or your own values boundary that you mm. are bumping up against. And that is already causing you uh, consternation and pain. And I know that feeling because it, it does did for me also in, in looking at pornography. Um, so there's a boundary that we have to deal with with ourselves about our own personal values mm -hmm. and morals before we can, before, I, would, I would conjecture before you can really in a healthy and pro proactive and progressive way, address a boundary with your partner, with your relationship. And to give just a, an example, maybe it hits, maybe it doesn't. Cammie and I, uh, we've been married now, I don't know, for almost 15 years. Um, and we, she and I both came prior to our marriage. We both were in very unhealthy relationships where uh, we continued to struggle with boundaries, I guess, <laughs> ourselves and our, the other people that we were dating. And we both had some insecurity about being left, being cheated on, being uh, abandoned. And so some of that came into our marriage early on. And at some point, I don't even remember really how it migrated or changed, but we started recognizing that although we are married and we both have made a very significant commitment to ourselves or to each other, uh, we do still literally pick to be together every day. Like she could just decide not to come home one day, or I could decide not to come home one day. Um, that is an option. And that is something that's within the realm of possibility. And somehow talking about that and being able to express to her, Hey, I recognize this, that you could just change your mind at some point and decide not to be in this relationship anymore. And I could, I could also, that actually relieved the fear of her deciding that at some point. Um, and I feel there's a relationship with the pornography also that once she and I have had conversations about the fact that sexual imagery gives me pleasure and is stimulating and something I enjoy, it took away a ton of the tension of, Oh, is he going to want to do that again? Well, yeah, now it's known that that's pleasurable for me and I enjoy it. So yes, that that's part of who I am and part of my sexual being. And suddenly there was less tension about, about the whole thing in some way, because we had, because we had frankly talked about it. Hans, how did you learn? Yeah. It was a kind of a, a reasonable expectation for yourself that you would probably look at this imagery and and uh, engage in this activity because because you, you know you, you you're i want to go back to this idea of making an i statement you knew about yourself yeah uh how did i learn that yeah, i yeah how did how, how did you know to have a boundary conversation where you said look partner here's who i am um i think thinking back about this specific instance it was about Cami wanting to understand more why I looked at porn or why I ha had done that, repeatedly did it. So she was inquisitive enough to want to know about what was going on and what the behavior was. 
and I think just in those conversations and, and I'm incredibly blessed and grateful for it, that she had enough space and enough uh, was able to reg self-regulate enough for me to be able to express that. And then we could address it together. Um, but that, I mean, even saying that I feel emotion about how sacred of a space that is and how fortunate I am to have that. And I recognize that in the moment of crisis that we had, and I imagine in the moment of crisis that a lot of people have, that space is not there to be explored together. There's not space for curiosity. Um, but it was, yeah, I guess maybe my thought for the people listening to the show and people dealing with pornography in their lives and the, the out of control feeling that is there is to give yourself give ourselves permission to start to uh, be honest with ourselves first and to try to wrangle through that. And we've talked about that quite a bit before about working that through for yourself about what that is and how it feels and try to get to peace with yourself and then be able to move into the relational talks, the partnership talks, the, rela the relationships and boundaries beyond that. Hans, as you were talking that uh, and continuing to pull on Doug's kind of minor league thoughts and getting honest with yourself, I think that's a really hard space to get honest of. I, I, I want to continue looking at sexual imagery. Yeah. Even saying that out loud, even giving space to even try that idea on. Right. Can be really uncomfortable. And there can be a lot of work of just trying to reconcile that. Yeah. I see, you know, the, like I loved what Doug said of what is the consequence if you don't continue to get honest and having years of trust eroded because of wanting, I, I guess I see a boundary can solve a moment. The idea of just stop that and the person who's coming with shame can agree of like, yeah, I'll stop that. And, and right. they get into the cycle of stop it and I will. And they're right back to where they are right. instead of pausing and like you, you walk through the process of getting really clear of, I think I do want to keep looking at this. That's uncomfortable and new. It is for sure. And it, um, I'm thinking back again to the price of admission of this conversation um, of having a conversation about sexual health and sexual desire and that, uh, um, it's difficult to have those conversations in a calm, non-emotional manner. And that seems, and yet that seems to be part of figuring out what these boundaries are. Another thought came of maybe trying to, like Doug said about playing in the minor leagues and giving an example of, Hey, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uphold this boundary this week. I think I'm going to go out and, and change my boundary for the week. Um, is there value in that? What are your guys' experience? And maybe Chris and Doug, what have you seen about just saying, I'm just going to shift my boundary back and see what that feels like. I'm going to, I'm going to watch porn and sexual imagery um, without a boundary and see what that feels like. Um, I disagree. It's not without a boundary. That's the new boundary. That's the new boundary. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's the thinking error. That is not without a boundary. Great. Yeah. And in fact, it upholds even one of the sexual health principles. I'm going to be honest about this. Be honest. Yeah. And when he mentioned the, the minor league, that it was basically for practice, right? So that's something you probably ought to go do with like a trusted friend, right? I mean, you. it's, it's not going to be as charged for you to learn how to practice a boundary if you've got that person that's maybe not your partner spouse. Yeah. And it's you getting comfortable with the language. And it's, I think there's a huge part of it for me, as we've been talking all about this, there did have to come to a point where I was able, I had to take ownership over it. Right. And I had to be comfortable with saying, I, I do want this. I, this is something that I enjoy. I do find pleasure in it. And I think once 
for instance, like in, in this relationship, like the guy is able to do that, is able to take ownership of like, this is something I really want. Then it, it sort of frees up for the partner to maybe start to look for understanding. And that's huge because really that's, that's what you're trying to get to, right? Is that understanding portion. And it might be tons of questions of, that are still not about understanding, but sort of used to try to find understanding, like help me understand this, when they, you, you're still like in the hurt process. You know, you do have to sort of, you you violated boundaries, you're going to have to write that, however that is, you know? And, but until you're able to sort of sit down and admit, whether it's to your friend or whatever, and you're practicing your boundaries and these other things and, and setting your, you know, what you want to be doing, you have to get comfortable with the point of, I do like this. This is pleasurable for me. And I think if you can't do that on, on that base level, you're real up. Like I constantly butted my head up and I think it's just sort of human nature that until you can own that and be comfortable with that, there's no way your partner's going to be comfortable with that. And I don't know if you seem like you had a big epiphany right there, actually. I did. I really did. I think you sharing whatever just happened with you. you um, like. While Jake was talking, it, like something clicked in my head that when a boundary is being perpetually violated, it's it's most likely because there's there's a, a, an honesty problem. So we've got the we've got the six principles of sexual health. Honesty is one of those, and shared values is one. And yeah. my guess is that the boundary is being created in what what the couple assumes is shared values, but one person has been dishonest about something that they value. Yeah. And and that dishonesty is what's creating the perpetual boundary crossing. And until that person can be honest with where they're at, what they want, what their desires are. Um, that boundary is going to continue to get crossed to the point where it either destroys the relationship or um, yes. anyway, that's, that's the problem. And so it just, the, the light bulb went off of like, Oh, every perpetual boundary issue is really an honesty issue because the person wouldn't keep breaking their agreement. If to, to do something or not do something, if, if they were, if they weren't lying to themselves about it. Yeah. One of the things some some men who are maybe listening to our conversation today, and maybe one of you at some point thought this, that uh, I don't feel like I'm able to control keeping this boundary. Uh, you know, I I I may need some help with that. Right. Uh, you know, or I you know, there's a boundary I do want to keep, and there's a boundary I want to think about. I you know, I may want to watch imagery, but right now I. Don't know if I'm able to control any boundary around imagery. You know, I mean, I mean, but that's also honesty. That's another honesty, and then on top, and then on top of that, there's a really interesting thought that I had of um, sometimes the how do I put this? I'm trying to put into words something that I've never said before. Um, sometimes the honesty of what it is that you want, and giving yourself permission to have it, even though it's might conflict or cause pain to your partner or yourself is that um, one, it removes the shame and then two, it removes the, like the taboo nature of it. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes maybe giving yourself permission to do it actually shows you that it's not really what you want. And the reason that you've been doing it in the past is because you self medicate or self soothe the, from the shame or because there is that part of your brain that is excited by the forbidden by the taboo. And then once you're given a blank check to just go do it, it loses its appeal or you loses the shame. And all of a sudden you're like, well, now I don't have anything that I need to soothe myself for because my partner knows exactly what I'm doing. And like, I, want back, I want to back up. I really appreciate what you're sharing. What I, what I, what I would invite the audience to do is, is, is to not assume they know what the fallout of that level of honesty you so beautifully described was. Because then you started going to what you thought might be the outcome of that. Honesty. Right, right, right. You really don't know, right? We, you, you don't, know. but I'm just saying that really is there's these fatalities. I loved how you walked us through, you know, why it's important to have that kind of honesty. 
and 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 how it fa brings us face to face with our values, brings people we're in a relationship with to these are my values, and how there might be a values difference. And this is very difficult terrain for a couple to just sit and just not react to, just sit with. Can I invite? So, so I keep having this example with Jake and me. And, and in honoring my agreements with Jake, I'm going to not give the details, but the peripheral story that I think might help because I remember a, a moment when, you know, Jake, you said maybe when the partner comes with honesty and then you move to a place of understanding. My first place wasn't understanding. It was a place of you actually had to face the possible ultimatum. Mm -hmm. Stop it or I'm out. And you came forward with your, you, I, I believe you got honest. You were willing to shift some of the boundaries or have a discussion. Like you were bringing that to the table. And I had to get really clear of if my ultimatum was in fact true. Like, am I willing to walk away? Like I said, I was. And even the story that I had told myself about what I would do wasn't true because it didn't factor in how much I loved you, the life I had built with you, the things I wanted to continue growing with you in. And so then your willingness to come forward and be honest allowed me to get honest and to be like, well, shoot, if I'm not going to leave him for it, then what? And it actually allowed me to expand into parts of myself I hadn't developed because they had lived in this threat part of myself, if that makes sense. I hadn't developed other ways to negotiate with you because my singular negotiation yeah, strategy know. was just sever the relationship. And okay, once you yeah, Kristen, out, if, if you could just slow off a minute, because that might be really interesting for people listening. It's something you might feel comfortable sharing. What's one thing you learned about yourself that you didn't know because you stayed in that ultimatum place? What, 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 my, what, what did you learn about Kristen? To my capacity to sit with majorly uncomfortable feelings with my partner where before I would just want to get out of it. And so the severing response was my fantasy to resolve those emotions or to protect me from them. I actually learned that I, and, and that actually drew on deeper parts of me that a severing was a severing response was learned from my childhood. Like the way you solve hard problems is you just cut off people or dip out. So I actually, it was the beginning of healing some attachment work, honestly, to be like, oh, you mean there's other ways to resolve problems than cutting people out? Huh. And I started to get to explore that. So that's what I learned about myself is I can remain, atta remain attached while being really disappointed, being really mad, being really hurt, that I can feel those with my partner instead of having to feel them and leave him. Does that, am I, I'm going to not even say, does that, that make was a wonderful is that clear? Yes, that was yeah. really clear. That was. Can really I ask really one follow up question on top of that? What has that done for you since? It's deepened my intimacy with Jake immensely yeah. because over time, like Hans said, I choose Jake every day. I I clo I've closed my exits, and that's. Intimacy, I always remind myself, is not for the faint of heart. I both crave it and, wow, it's wildly hard and uncomfortable. <laughs> but um, what it's done for me, well, I guess if I'm not going to leave him, I have a couple of choices. I can maneuver through this miserably and, and or I can, like, try to figure out new strategies and way to cope and have conversations I've never had. So I, I feel like I've grown immensely. But So yeah. what I'm hearing you say is hidden behind or inside of this challenging moral dilemma that you faced was actually a key to discovering a deeper, truer version of yourself and maybe loving on a, a level that you didn't know existed. I have no idea. I, I never in my wildest of dreams, and I think Jake could attest to this, would I have ever thought that I'd be sitting here on a sexual health show uh, not advocating for porn, but saying, wow, there's other ways you can have conversations. It's not just living in the bad, the bad or good. I was 100% against it. I was the classic. Right. So it was my key. But facing 
what felt like the scariest part of my life and my relationship. I was terrified of being married to someone who could be a porn addict. Actually facing that allowed me to get to know and see my husband in ways that I didn't even know were possible and parts of myself that I didn't even know were possible. But it was, I think Jake and I could say some of those conversations were terrifying because I think we both knew that we're like, I guess we're willing to put everything on the line by showing up authentically. I, I believe that Jake was willing to be like, I guess if this means my marriage is over, the price is too high to stay in a false marriage. So then that's the thing. You can love the facade of a person or you can get to love the actual person. Yeah. And it feels so good to be loved for who and how I am. And, and an apo- unapologetically to be loved that way is one of the sweetest feelings in the entire world. And to allow someone to love you like that, you have to be willing to make amends for all the boundaries you've crossed in the past. You have to be vulnerable enough to show up and you have to be courageous enough to say, this is who and how I am. I, I like this. But we do have boundaries. Like I don't want to send the impression that it's now just a blank check, a, a free for all. No, I'm talking about that first. Those first conversations, though, Chris, because so much of us are coming up against divorce, or and we're le- we're losing our families and our lives and our church callings and everything in between, and it, it's heavy duty. But it's, I mean, for me, going back to that sort of old cycle just. I, it's such a better way, you know, and to continue to have conversations, to, to grow our relationship and develop boundaries and, and to be open and honest. I mean, that's, so Nate, to answer your question for me, for us, from on my perspective, it was, I mean, we're closer after than we were ever, ever were before. But that was a wedge that had that was, you know, going between us. And so it pulled us apart and it allowed us to come back together. But we did have to deal in that part where we were on way opposite sides of the table. Such an interesting juxtaposition. That sometimes to have the thing that you want the most, you have to face the thing that you least want to face. What's the um, Joseph Campbell quote that the treasure you seek is in the cave you fear to enter? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. The, the version I know is, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Yeah, and maybe that 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 conversation, whether it's admitting I, I want this, I find pleasure in it, or whether it's saying, you know, I'm going to risk losing everything in, in order to be honest about who I am, or whether it's saying, I don't like this, but I also don't want you to hide who you are. I want to see you and all of you, even the ugly parts, and we'll figure it out. Like those are terrifying conversations that require an immense amount of courage and vulnerability. And um, and sometimes I'm going to just add some of the spaces we're talking about here. Uh, sometimes people aren't able to do just the two of them. They may, they may need somebody in a room to help yes. them have yeah. conversations. And yes. Yes, that, that, so I, if people are listening to this, I think it's really important to, to be honest with yourself as, as a couple as well. And would it be better if we had this conversation with a third person in the room to help us do this conversation better? Because these are not, you know, easy conversations. Many people have had much training or practice or confidence in doing. It's also worth mentioning that there's no guarantee that it's going to go well. No. Like for many people, the result is that you do part ways. The, it, the relationship doesn't work out because there is a lack of shared values that are that you can't reconcile. Yeah. And that's a scary thing to live with. But I think the alternative is is like living in a uh, what's like a the the out the outer veneer looks good, but the inside is kind of I, I know the Bible reference is like the painted sepulcher or the you don't put old wine in new bottles, like maybe on the outside it looks good, but on the inside it's kind of a, a mess. And live, spending the entire your entire life in a marriage where you're not truly known or seen, or there's secrets, or like that's that's the price you pay for avoiding these conversations. 
That's and a. Then, I learned a lot. I the first twenty minutes of this episode, I was like, "This is my least favorite episode we've ever done." And then the last twenty minutes, were like, "This is my favorite episode that we've ever done." <laughs> um, I like your honesty. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank thank you to especially J I think Jake and Kristen for me for me personally yeah. today. Like, I really appreciate you guys sharing what you shared. Um, I, I had a lot of emotional stuff around this just and i think i gained a lot of clarity because of what you guys shared doug and hans you guys both lent some real clarity for me today as well and uh i, I did not i expected us to come out of this conversation about boundaries with a lot more like tactical practical this is what you do when somebody crosses a boundary and really what it boils down to is like if a boundary is being crossed over and over and over again there's a lack of shared values and there's a lack of honesty and you need to sit down and have a harder conversation beyond you need to stop doing this <laughs> or I need to stop doing this. Yep. There's a, there's an underlying problem that's going unaddressed and that's a that's a huge mind shift for me. So mm -hmm. thanks guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everyone. Anybody else want to say anything to wrap this up or are we good? Here's an example of a boundary challenge. Are we going to end now or in 2 minutes? <laughs> I need to end now because I have to, <laughs> to my chat. All right. Well, we'll see everybody next week for another episode.